So uh, welcome to Rust 101, the new lecture series to replace Python 201. Uh, we thought that we wanted to bring in a new language and, uh, well, you know, teach people how to program in Rust. So a bit of introduction, I'm gonna introduce myself first. So that's a much prettier photo of me uh, than, I, than I look now, but I'm Jordan Hall. Uh, I was born and raised in South Wales. I speak Welsh fluently and I am a second year computing student here at Imperial College London. I imagine most of you are also second years at Imperial College London, or I like that, students here. So a uh, bit of my CV, my background, I was, an, my first job ever was as an ML engineer at uh, a company called The Tower and uh, simple classification stuff, I, I won't get too much into it. I was a data visualization engineer at ICT Blue Limited, which is a startup by a research at Imperial, a researcher at Imperial. And uh, over the summer, I'm interning at Microsoft. Um, and here are my uh, <laughs> here are my uh, GitHub links. So, uh, oh, sorry, my uh, social media links. I thought that somebody might find that interesting. Um, the lecture slides, actually, the reason for the GitHub, my lecture slides will be put on GitHub afterwards. So um, yes, that's just a bit of introduction for me. Um, so I'll discuss what I'm going to do throughout the lecture series and um, a bit about what I expect from you as well, I guess. So I'm gonna go over this first lecture series, of uh, this first lecture at least, I'm gonna go over the basics of Rust, the very basics, um, variables, types, um, control, flow, and functions. That's, and, and a bit about the borrow checker, which is a concept you'll come to know well. And um, then, uh, that, so that's, that's all. There's not gonna be a huge amount of interactive programming, live programming, except for if, well, and this is what I want from you, if something's confusing, I, I want you to call it out, okay? I want you to raise your hand or even shout out from the audience and say, Jordan, I don't understand this concept. Um, and then I will, well, maybe explain it better, or if necessary, I'll do a live share. Uh, for the purposes of this, uh, for the purposes of this uh, specific, um, yeah, for the purposes of this specific lecture, I'm going to be using what's known as Rust Playground. Whenever I need to uh, demonstrate something to you, I'll make the font bigger, I promise. Um, but this is really good to have open on your laptops. It's an interactive web IDE and allows you to program in Rust and run it. It's really quick and um, uh, will allow you to play around with the concepts live. This is sort of what I expect from you, I guess. Um, Okay, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, back on with the slides. So we've hit a major problem in programming, systems programming in particular. We're now at a point where we are starting to build systems that are far more complicated than us, far, far more complicated, and we have no idea how to manage that. Hello? Uh, can you clarify what that web page was? What's what, that, what sorry? Rust program? Oh, Rust Playground. Oh, Rust Playground. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry, maybe I didn't yeah, say that uh, clearly enough. But Rust Playground, uh, it was built by the Rust Foundation. So, um, yes, back on to what I was saying. Um, we are starting to create systems that are much more complicated than us. Uh, and uh, this is causing an issue. We are no longer able to keep track of what our programs are doing in an effective way. And this is causing some major issues in in the world of programming. I'm sure time and time again, you find that, oh, this company has had this error, which could have been easily stoppable if only they knew what their programs were doing. And as a result, they lost a couple of billion or whatever. Um, so these are runtime books, all of them. So you have data races where suddenly your values change mid program and you don't know why. Uh, this also applies mainly to multi-threading. So, um, like one thread will try to, will access a value, another thread will change that value, and then the first thread is gonna pretend like the original value still applies. Uh, and that's not particularly great. If any of you don't synchronization, I think those of you in first year are gonna start doing synchronization next week with Java, uh, you know that um, that is a massive, massive problem. Uh, no point of bugs. Uh, maybe when I was uh, a lesser Java programmer, um, but when I was new to Java, this was like the main thing that I had issue with. Null pointers everywhere. And that was a major issue. Uh, some languages, much like Kotlin, they've 
they've helped with this massively by, by making the null type optional, I guess. Uh, segmentation faults. So when you try to dereference a uh, when you try to dereference a reference to a bit of memory that your program does not own. Uh, for example, the ref, uh, the uh, zero location of memory, which always like faults on x86 CPUs. Um, if you worked in C and C++, you know what I'm talking about. Um, those of you who have probably done pentos last term, uh, if you're in year two, and that was probably the bug that I ran into the most. It was Oh, it took so much time. Uh, double freeze. So you've allocated some memory onto the heap and you free it somewhere and then you free it somewhere again. It's quite self-explanatory. And that's a runtime error. Um, use after freeze. So you free it and then you try to access the value. Doesn't always cause a, um, doesn't always cause a runtime error, but will definitely cause unpredictable behavior. Uh, and memory leaks. So you've allocated something and you haven't freed it. So as I say here, these bugs are manageable back when code only needed to run on one thread. Uh, it's pretty easy to keep track of what's going on. Uh, we left the impossible task of like mass parallelism to operating system writers, networking uh, developers, and um, uh, database systems developers. Um, other developers only had to wait until the next process generation came around to double the speed of their CPU. Um, and well, double the speed of their code and CPU. So we have a problem now though. So what I just said was that you only had to wait around 18 months to get all of your code to run faster. And it was almost magic. You place the CPU in a new motherboard, you run it and it's done. But that's not the case anymore. CPU speed is stagnating massively. It almost hasn't increased in the past 10 years from what I remember. Um, but the number of cores on a chip, that's growing massively. But we don't really know how to write these safe, secure, and reliable current code in a way that's manageable. Um, and I, I, I'll give some examples uh, in a bit, but um, that, that is a major problem because you're all going to be writing code. And the likeliness is when you're of age, when, when maybe you're 30, everything, or when we're, we're 30, everything is going to be run parallelized. And so you need to figure out how we need to figure out how we need to uh, how we can manage the increased complexity of that code. Um, so there are potential solutions. We have a runtime package with our code, the Java, Java, um, uh, sorry, the Java runtime environment is a beautiful piece of code. It is amazing. Um, it's so fast for what it is. And uh, honestly, the only issue I have with it is the fact that in order to garbage collect, in order to prevent those memory leaks and the lack of manual allocation of freeing, it has to do short pause. So it pauses it, pauses the runtime, uh, your code is paused for maybe a couple of milliseconds, it frees everything that isn't connected to the stack anymore, and then your code can continue. Um, and that's not great for critical systems. If, you are have, if you're writing maybe an autonomous car and it stops computing for a few seconds, you're gonna be in trouble, and so that's a big issue. Uh, we can write static analyzers that check our code for common mistakes. Uh, Valgrind, if you are into C and C++, is a very good tool. It saved my butt quite a few times. But um, it's not the solution we're looking for. Uh, figuring out whether or not a piece of code will have the problems I just described is not actually, um, is not actually computable. You, you can't compute it. It's undecidable. And so that will help with most things, but not everything that we need, especially in a language that allows you to do everything. Um, or we can rethink the way that we uh, write code to be better suited towards these specific problems. And uh, I mean, Rust is the thing that rethought the way we write code. And um, in quite a, quite a, a new way, uh, not much had been done prior to Rust that that solves it in the way that Rust does. So um, yeah, so the root of the problem is we don't keep track of what code is doing to our data. We Several parts of a program can change and read the data at the same time, and keeping track of when we need to free memory is not trivial. Rust, were promised, Rust promises as part of its guarantee at runtime, uh, sorry, at, 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 that it will deal with these problems at compile time. And if your code has these problems in it, then the, the Rust compiler would just say, no, you can't compile, it's not allowed. And then when, as a result, whenever you run a code, uh, run a piece of code written in Rust, none of these problems will apply to you. 
So this is a bit of C code, actually. Um, this is a bit of C code I wrote to make a point, we could say. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this code? There, there are several bugs that don't show up until one time. Does anyone know? Any guesses, maybe? I'll give you a few more minutes. Yes. Sorry? So yeah, use after, uh, use after free, down in printf, uh, we are trying to access temp and temp no longer, well, no longer has any memory allocated. Oh, sorry, no, um, trying to access a variable in temp, which has since been free. Uh, this is a double singleton uh, list. So it's a single, so it's a 2D array with just one value in it. So yes, sorry, did you have that? Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Everyone I've shown so far that didn't catch that actually. So yes, array is being leaked because we malloc it and then we don't, we don't free it at the end. So that's a memory leak anymore. You can make a wild guess maybe, then maybe that'll be worth it. Okay, right. I have the solution. Oh, go on, Charlie. You have to put size of install there, but that's based on size of install. That's a double pointer to an array. So it's double pointer to an int, sorry. Uh, so to the array. Um, yeah, so these are the problems I think are wrong with this code. Some of these are more subjective than others, but it's what I think. So. We have unchecked aliasing. So array, sorry, temp uh, points to a reference of the first value of array. Um, and the code does nothing to ensure that these two things are consistent, which, which is a problem. It is a problem. Um, even in this small example, it's definitely a problem as we'll see later on. And then in actual, in actual code bases, this is also a problem. We have mutation. Mutation is only a problem when we have a reference to something else because we've created a reference to an array. And at that point, we don't know what's going to happen to that array. Uh, sorry, what's going to happen to the values in that array. And so, and if, if, you, if you give temp to a thread, it doesn't know like what the value, it can't be sure of what the value is unless it uses a, a lock system or something complicated like that. We have a free um, and we're freeing temp, but temp is an alias to uh, array. And that's an issue, um, or to a value in array, sorry. Uh, and that's an issue because, well, now array has been changed by temp, which is an alias to an array. It's complicated, but I had to make an example which showed everything on a nice little slide. Um, typing compatibility. So the compiler I used, um would not actually point this out but i think some other compilers would be like hey you're trying to assign an int to a pointer or pointers of ints uh, and then set ball um and use after free more specifically um because we've set that value to be zero and then we're trying to use it um and then memory leak at the end because as as someone pointed out uh it was i yeah it, it was never freed after it was malloc and so this is a big issue in concurrent code. Now there's a little sign up there and this man is on a standing desk. This is actually Mozilla offices. It says you must be this tall to write multi-threaded code. <laughs> I'm 5'4". That's, I, I, I couldn't see that sign if I was standing next to him. Like I wouldn't be able to read it. And it's because of this complexity. Uh, it's just, you can't keep track of what's going on. And it, it, it makes your code hard to maintain. An example of this, Oh, sorry, uh, yeah. So it was a uh, Rust was initially developed by Graydon Hoare, an employee of Microsoft, um, uh, sorry, Mozilla in 2006. Graydon noticed that making concurrent programs fast was practically impossible. Uh, so I meant quickly there, not fast. Uh, and this is the case I'm talking about. Mozilla had a feature request wherein a component of Firefox needed to be optimized for multiple CPUs. Effectively, the CSS rendering um, scheme that Firefox uses has to be synchronized over all windows of Firefox. Every Firefox window you have open because of just, because of the nature of how it, how it works, I guess. And you can't just rewrite it after you've done that. Um, that issue was open for seven years before it was closed in 2015. So seven years to make one bit of a browser multi-threaded. That doesn't seem like the type of development that we need to do nowadays. It, it's too slow and 
things are getting fat, the things are getting slower. Well, not getting slower, but the stagnating in speed. You can't just wait for a better CPU to come out if your code is multi, is single threaded. And so this is what Rust is. Rust is a systems language with three major pillars. So performance, reliability, and productivity. Rust is blazingly fast and memory efficient with no runtime or garbage collector. It can power performance critical services, uh, such as like autonomous cars, perhaps, uh, run on embedded devices and easily integrate with other languages. Reliability, so Rust type system and own ownership model, guarantee memory safety and thread safety. Guaranteed, if your code compiles, it has memory safety, so no freeze, no freeze, at, sorry, no double freeze, no freeze after use, no unchecked aliasing, no mute, um, sorry, uh, incorrect mutation of aliases or anything like that. Um, and this is like, when I, when I figured out that Ross said it can promise to do that, when I, when I read that part, I didn't believe it. It was, it was impossible to me that they could do that. I thought it was not possible, but they managed to do it. And productivity, so Rust is actually already mature, which is kind of nuts considering it's about seven years old. There exists loads of development tools and they are actually incredibly easy to use. Cargo, Clippy, Formats, uh, Crates.io, which is a good website uh, for libraries, Crates, we call them in Rust, I guess. Um, and so all, all of this already exists and it's very, very well made. It's already mature. And so what is Rust now? Well, here's a little quote. Um, oh, I missed a quote from before. Let me go back to that. Yeah, so Chris Dickinson, uh, an employee at NPM, so Node Package Manager, said, my biggest compliment to Rust is that it's boring. That's, and this is an amazing compliment. Rust only allows you to do things in a certain number of ways. You have to conform to what Rust thinks is correct. And you have to work around that. Of course, it's a learning curve, right? Every language is a learning curve after all. But node package manager or node package manager is almost entirely in Rust now. And so it must be something good about it, right? If if the node package manager of JavaScript, 10 billion downloads per day of, of the packages, if they use it, then there has to be something good for that. So um, yeah, so Miguel de Acatza, I probably butchered that unfortunately, uh, founder of No Mono and Xamarin Products said that they would like to see Rust. Um, take the place of C++ uh, and C. Um, and operating systems are being written in Rust everywhere. Because, I mean, if you can ensure thread safety, why wouldn't you? So, where is Rust now? In May 2015, Rust was released into the public. Uh, unfortunately, it took a bit of a, how do you say, people didn't really know what was going to happen to it when uh, Mozilla let go of 250 out of their 1,000 employees in 2020. Uh, including a lot of the Rust team and almost entirely scrapping server, which was the new uh, browser made entirely in Rust. And in 2021, luckily, with a load of companies, um, well, five founding companies, the Rust Foundation was announced and it, had, it has copyright over all of Rust's uh, internal source code. And um, that's actually open source too. So you can download the Rust compiler and figure out how it works, with which um, if you're doing WAC, um, like looking at another language's compiler is actually super good for directing you and how to, and especially because, um, especially in a, a language which is as nice as this, I would say. Uh, so yeah, so AWS, um, Huawei, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla, they are the ones who founded Rust. And then following this, Google added Rust for the support of Android open source project, making C and C++ no longer, no longer necessary anywhere in that. Uh, Rust is seven years old now. It's already used everywhere. So Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Amazon just released a really nice article detailing how they use Rust for Amazon Prime video streaming. And it is amazing uh, how they use it. Uh, Facebook, which um, rewrote a huge bunch of their code in Rust. Discord, Figma, Figma is entirely written in Rust. Dropbox is transferring all of the low level stuff into Rust. NPM, like I said, and the list is extremely long. Um, oh. Another one I didn't add it to the list, I don't think, but, um, oh no, I added it to the bottom, sorry. So in Stack Overflow's 2021 survey, um, Rust was rated the number one most loved language for the sixth year in a row. So people who program in Rust really love it. And Crates.io, I just said earlier, has 75,000 crates and most, I'd say the majority of them are really good, really core cool crates, core cool libraries. Um, so, uh, the Rust kernel, sorry, the Linux kernel 
has only ever had one language in it, which is C, if you discount assembly, that is. Uh, and there was major pushes for C++ to be added for decades now. And Rust has just been added as the first ever secondary language to uh, their Linux kernel. And Linus is even happy about this, which if you've read any article written by Linus, you know that ma that man is not happy about anything. Like he's constantly in a state of just of pure rage, I gotta be honest. So Rust 101, this is where I actually begin teaching you what Rust is, uh, sorry, no, how to program in Rust. And this is Ferris the Crab, which is Rust's little mascot, it's quite nice. Um, yes, so this is a roadmap, it's probably too, no, I think it's reasonable. So this is what I wanna teach in these six hours, and I'm almost certainly not gonna do it, but hopefully I'll get most of it done. So today I'm gonna go over types, functions, control flow, and a bit about the bar checker if I can. So um, yeah, and um, I'm not gonna go over the sub subcategories because we are literally studying them now. So this is the basic layout of Rust. You type cargo new hello world, creates a new crate called hello world, unsurprisingly. Um, cargo is the build tools for, for, for Rust. Everything in Rust is named something to do with building or you know Rust, for example. Um, and um, you have this little body. This main function is necessary for most of the programs you're gonna be write, writing, or the programs you're gonna be running at least. And this is how you print hello world. And this is weird syntax. This syntax you don't really see anywhere else. So you have fn, so function doesn't, you don't need to write function, you know what fn means, right? We all use lol and you know, et cetera. Uh, main and then open curly braces and print line bang. What does bang mean? Well, bang is a macro. I'll teach you a bit about what they mean later, but basically this means that when the Rust compiler comes along and, and starts to mess, you know, starts to translate the code to assembly, um, it expands this into a bigger, uh, in, into a bigger um, piece of code. Um, and you don't have to worry about that because macros are actually really good. And so we print hello world. And if you type cargo run, that'll run your code and it'll come out with hello world, unsurprisingly. Be a pretty bad language if it didn't. So types, right? So you have unsigned integers. Uh, so this, these are their names. So you have u8, u16, u32, u64, u128, and u size. So u size is just the largest amount of bytes that your system can handle. Uh, sorry, the number of bits that your system can handle. Then the u's are, uh, how to say, uh, the u's are how many bits are needed to store this particular representation of an unsigned integer. That's how you declare a variable. Let x colon u8 is equal to 42. This says that I want to create a new variable. It's a type u8, so that's where the type is. And it is equal to 42. Now, if you got rid of the 42, your Rust program wouldn't compile. All variables need to be declared, sorry, need to be assigned when they're declared in Rust. Um, so that you, uh, you can't have any, yep that let you assign a negative number to an unsigned value. I've never tried it. It's not something that would, but this is a good, a good, re, good time to bust up, to bust up the, uh, this. So uh, how do I make this bigger now? Oh, that's wonderful. Um, okay, so I say like let x u8 is equal to minus, just say eight, and then, Try to run that. What would happen? Would you? Ah, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Not allowing, um, like, not allowing you to declare something without assigning it causes scope problems. Like, if you need to declare something outside a certain scope, but you don't know what it's supposed to be yet. Hmm. Oh no, sorry, sorry, um, sorry. No, I, I, I got that wrong. You are correct. Yeah, absolutely. So you can declare uh, variables uh, before assigning them. But what you can't do is use them before assignment. So I can say, oh, and you also need the type to be there for, for sure. Uh, and then if I just say like, um, let y is equal to x plus four, uh, and then try to compile this. So unused variable y. Uh, oh, 
Okay, that's actually something different. So U8 has a default type. That default type is zero. So it is being assigned a value. Um, in cases where you don't have a default value, um, Ross will freak out uh, and the compiler will tell you that you can't, can't write it. But everything needs to be assigned before it can be used. Um, but yeah, you're right. You don't have to declare things in the same scope you use them. Um, yes. Two questions. Uh -huh. Does the let allow for reassignment? Does the let allow for reassignment? What yeah, do you think? Or is it, is it constant? Hmm. So uh, if we say U8 is equal to 8, and then I say, oh, right. Oh, you're asking about mutability. Yeah. Right. No. Um, let, I, I was going to go over that in the slides, but let's. So when you declare a variable like this, it's not mutable. Uh, you can't reassign it. If I try to reassign it, so I say x is equal to 4, why not? Uh, and then try running it. Then uh, value assigned to x is never used and. Oh, sorry, those are warnings. Sorry, the, the Rust compiler. Sorry, this is quite small <laughs> because the form has to be so big. But um, yeah, it could not compile. You can't assign twice to an immutable variable. Um, yeah, and your next question? My next question was you have U128 there on a 64 bit machine, which doesn't support them. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, Rust compiles under LLVM uh, and uh, a back end. We will say that C uses a McClang compiler for. Um, uh, for C. And um, that does allow most systems that support uh, multi uh, word, uh, multi word arithmetic, uh, such as a, a 64, sorry, a, a 64 bit machine to, to work with these, uh, with sizes of 128 bits. Um, and um, yes, so, so it, um, I, you can look up on Godbolt exactly how that works. Um, it's uh, it, it's quite interesting how how Rust deals with that, but yes, uh, you can do that. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. So I'll get I'll get on to that. Um, it's one of it's one of the uh, slides, but that is a good question. So then you have sign integers, which are the same with an I instead of a U. And, oh, that's not meant to say F32, that's meant to say I32. If we let Y is equal to minus 42, we don't need to say what type it is because certain, because uh, Rust will automatically figure out uh, the type inferences for this. It is of I32, not F32. I'll go back and change that later. Um, so where you want it to be a U8, you have to say this is a U8. But when you're declaring a variable like this, it will automatically assume you mean an I32, um, a 32-bit integer. OK, next slide. Right, floating point numbers, you have, oh yeah, go on. Quick one. If you have, let's say, a I8, uh -huh. right, and you set its value to a value that's higher than something you can store, well, that could be represented in a signed um, eight bit number. Mm -hmm. Would it then just automatically turn it into a negative number with the um, eight bit or not? Mm. Okay, so we'll try that. So let's say uh, two, five, six. Oh, wait, sorry, no. Um, five. Sorry, two, five, five is the largest number, but sorry. Uh, yeah, two, five, five. Yeah, two, five. And it's two, five, five. Will it become a negative? I H two five five, and then we'll I'll print it for gravity. Uh, so print line, um, and this is how you include. I was going to get to it in a bit, but this is how you include variables in a print statement. Um, this is allowed because of the macro. This wouldn't be allowed without the macro. Uh, the the bang, that's to say. And like if we try to print X, and when we run, what do we get? Ah, uh, literal out of range for an IA. It's not bitwise, it's yeah. based on so, the so, actual value. Yeah, this is a compile time feature, um, which which is quite nice. Yes. Why is the inferred uh, type for uh, 32 bits rather than the I size or U size? Which is Sorry, could you say like, that again? Like why is the uh, inferred type I32 instead of like I size? Which oh, the default type. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
That's a good question. It's just uh, it's just a design choice when writing a compiler. Um, and um, the compiler writer said, oh, well, we don't really want to make everything, you know, I8. So we don't want to make everything I16s or U whatever. So they said, oh, well, I32 is just a nice, a nice value that most systems can support nowadays. We'll make it. We'll we'll make that default value, and so that, that that's why um, it's nothing particularly special about I thirty two other than, other than that. I guess they could have done I eight. That would have been interesting. I was just wondering why it wasn't I size, given that that would be specific to the like compilation target. Yeah, um, good point. So I size is specific to the compilation target. Well, I mean, but at the same time, uh, you, most values you're going to be working with aren't in the range of an I size. Um, so 64 bits is a, is a large, large number. I, I'm not exactly sure. You might want to, you might want to ask them. Actually, they're very open to questions. Uh, the, the Rust, the Rust compiler writers. Okay, so uh, F32 and F64. So these are floating point numbers with um, 32 and 64 bits. The naming seems quite natural, I would say. And this is how you instantiate. It, uh, sorry, um, this is how you declare uh, a F64 bit number. So anything which is a floating point number when you declare it, is going to have an F64. I did ask, well, I did look up why that was the case. And it turns out uh, on most architectures nowadays, F64s are just as fast as F32s. And if you need the, if you need the memory, let's just say, then that's an optimization you can make yourself. And if you want it to be specifically an F32, then you have to declare that yourself uh, by specifying the type. So there are more types. So there are bool, string, and character. I haven't demonstrated string because it requires a bit of, bit of. I, I don't want to introduce um, how that works until, until we have enough knowledge about how Rust works itself. So we can let B is equal to true. Uh, that it knows that it's a, a boolean. Let C is equal to Q, and um, it knows it's a character. You don't need to specify the type. The type inference is pretty good, and also supports emojis. But my LaTeX editor can't, so there was no smiley face there. Uh, I tried that, but I, I couldn't. I, I, I genuinely tried that, but I'm using um, uh, what am I using for the for the what I'm using for the code blocks doesn't allow me to because it pastes everything in, so I can't actually add any LaTeX formatting to my code blocks. Okay, so printing variables. Uh, I demonstrated a bit of this later. Whenever you want a variable. You can just put those curly braces, and um, you can add arguments to the curly braces. I will discuss them in a bit later, and then afterwards you declare in order of where they show up in the string what the variables you want to print are. And so in this case, your answer is forty-two will be printed to the terminal. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, basic arithmetic. Uh, I don't think I need to teach you what these means. Uh, these mean, but um, you have, well, you can do any sort of addition you can or any sort of comparison uh, or um, uh, operator you can do in most languages. It's nothing special about this. Um, and yeah, most, well, for all of these, the types are inferred. So um, if you have a good like VS Code uh, plugin, it'll tell you what those types are just inline. It's very, very nice. Uh, it's called Rust Analyzer. And then W is equal to X plus Z. Why is why is that an error? Why won't it let you compile if if you do that? Yeah. Value. Sorry. There is a boolean value. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's incompatible types for addition is is what the Rust compiler will give you, and um, that's just a very basic introduction. You can't add a boolean and uh, an integer. You can't add a boolean and a character. You you can't add two types which add is not already defined together. And um, what's wrong with do? Right, so variable redefinition, which is a very nice feature in my opinion, makes it can make your code much uh, much smaller in some cases without needing the mutability because you don't always want your stuff to be mutable. So uh, your variables be mutable. So let X is equal to five and then let X is equal to true. If you then run this code, what you'll get is True. X has been redefined. So the first X, the I32X, has gone out of scope. It no longer exists. And what's reintroduced to the scope is an X with a bool value. So um, 
This is like similar to shadowing, but it's redefinition in Rust. Um, and X goes out of scope when you do this. Um, now, how does Rust know? How does a Rust compiler know when things go out of scope? And this is due to a feature of the language known as lifetimes. Uh, I'll get into that a bit later because it's a very late topic to talk about. It's quite complicated, but um, eventually you get a feel for how it works. And um, that's that, that's that, that's all about variable redefinition. So mutability. So I've demonstrated this earlier, but uh, if you create an I32 called that uh, called X and assign an I6 and then try to reassign it 42, the Rust compiler will not. It won't allow you to compile your code um, because it's not a mutable variable that you're trying to mutate. Um, and yeah, um, if you print it, um, you've seen the uh, error messages I gave earlier, so I won't get into that. And um, this is how you declare mutable variables. So let mute, mute is just a, a shortening of mutable, uh, equals 96. If you say now X is equal to 42, the Rust compiler will be happy with that and will allow you to um, mutate that variable nicely. And if you print X, it'll be 42. Static variables and constants. And so this is stuff that exists in the global scope. Um, so outside of all your functions and even your main, even your main statement and available to all, all functions. Um, yeah, so I am a constant. You have to define types, uh, types um, with constants. With constants, you always have to define types. Same with um, static variables. So you can say it's equal to 42 and uh, truth is a bool, I am a constant is equivalent to 42. Uh, so if you print is I am a constant 42, no matter there's an extra underscore, but it'll print uh, true. Um, uh, so the types do need to be specified. What is the difference between static and const? So the difference between static and const is that static allows you to potentially mutate things. Um, so you can potentially change static constants, oh, sorry, uh, static variables, if you so desire. The issue is that's a data race because if one thread is trying to access this static variable and it's available to the threads and another thread tries to change it, you, not, you now not know what, um, uh, what the first thread is seeing. It's, you, you can't model it in any specific way. So this requires a feature of Rust, which can seem quite scary at first. I've actually never had to use it because Rust provides enough functionality in this language such that you almost never need to use this feature. And it has a scary name. It's called unsafe. I know, I know. Now, in order to read or write to a mutable static variable, you need to have the unsafe block. You're telling the compiler, look, I know what I'm doing. I know that this will be okay. And in this instance, it absolutely is okay because I'm the only threat. Now, you don't want to write code that uses unsafe. And unsafe does not, well, so you don't always want to write code that's unsafe. Sometimes you need to. Uh, we'll get onto that in the next lecture. But um, you're, like, you're not going to be writing unsafe. Um, and so then you can reassign false, uh, sorry, truth to be false. And then I'm a constant is 42, is true. But truth tells me it's, and then whatever. And so it demonstrates that it's, been changed um, from its runtime as it's compiled that value. Um, and so uh, that's why we need unsafe. Now you're not gonna be like, I put this in just as a brain teaser. You can read up on what unsafe means, but I have literally never written a project line with unsafe in it ever. It's not necessary unless you're like, like doing some really low level stuff. Yes. So does the stat static variable also work like in C, for example? Is it, is it allocated in the data segment? Static, um, so, uh, so I think the question, if I repeat it and you tell me whether or not it was correct, was um, is this static variable um, accessible to variables outside of um, this uh, module, module file? Uh, the answer is pretty sure not, but <laughs> I definitely recommend looking that up. Um, because I'm not actually entirely sure about that myself. Um, I don't think it is. I think you can make it public if you want that to be the case. I'm pretty sure that's the case, but do look it up. Uh, I'll get back to you um, 
on that later after I make it to research it myself. Um, so typecasting, yeah, this is the, we had a question about this earlier. What happens if you try this code? So you, you create an x to u32 is equal to 10, you create a y is equal to 8 u8. I wanted to point this out. This is another way you can, for, for, co for constant literals, that's how you, um, that's another way you can say what type it is. So in the above, you say the type of x is u32, and it's inferred to be, uh, uh, x is then the, a value of that type. And then it infers the type of y because you specify that uh, 8 is a u8 and not a you know youth or not just a regular user too you can do that for quite a few variables but all the primitives i showed you actually you can you can do that except for google string and all of the integral as like um integer and floats you can do that for all integers and floats what happens if we try this then um z is equal to u size x plus y so we're creating a z it's a u size and we're trying to add x and y that's going to fail the Rust compiler does not like that. The Rust compiler is religious when it comes to this specific thing. It's type inference is really good, but doesn't like you casting things implicitly. Um, and uh, I think I showed you an example of that in the C code where that can sort of go wrong if you're not very careful with your code. Um, so yeah, it just won't let you do this. And so that there's ways we can get around this. It's called the as keyword. So you can say that, we are casting this explicitly. This is explicit casting. So same, same code as before, except Z is one way you can do it, which is to say Y is now equal to a U32. And then it allows you to add X and Y together. Oh, sorry, cast Y to a U32. And then cast the result of that to a U size. Or you could say X as U size plus Y as U size, and your result will be a U size. Um, there's no particular reason why Rust, like uh, apart from what I mentioned earlier, for safe types like this, um, there's no reason why it can't, it, it wouldn't be able to, if, if the compiler right is so desired, to have that allowed, allowed to implicitly cast. But it's just a choice they've made and we have to live with it. And this isn't a problem nearly as you might think it is uh, if you're careful with your code. Compound types. Um, and by that, I mean arrays and tuples. Um, so array, this is how you, and define an array. Um, you say let array is equal to, and then open braces, sorry, open brackets, uh, one, two, and however many you want. Um, that, that second line is a variable redefinition. It's another way of saying, hey, make me, sorry, this is a way of saying, hey, make me a, an array of 15, size 15, and then put this value in all of those, in all of those slots. It's really nice. I wish we had this in like some other languages that I use, but we don't. Um, and then if you specify the type of that variable, uh, then the type of the array will be um, a, a U8 uh, or whatever size, uh, whatever type you specify. And then um, we can peek into that array. We can get a value from that array. Um, X is equal to array at 14. Uh, so this is the 14th position of the array. Rust has bounds checking on arrays and vectors. So I'll teach you a bit about vectors later, but they're very similar to arrays, um, except they can grow, that's pretty much all. Um, and um, you can, if I try to access the 15th, or like, sorry, um, if I access um, array at 15, then uh, it's going to cause a runtime crash, right? It's going to say, no, you can't do that undefined behavior. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes, not going to let you do it. So tuples, yeah, that's just any questions or arrays. There's usually a lot of like things that are a bit, but this is mostly similar to other languages we've seen before, apart from maybe its definitions. Tuple, um, is, and then you can, tuples is another type of compound types, um, except you can have multiple different uh, types inside of a tuple. So you can have one, true, and h, and that allows you to. Um, have a tuple with the first value of a size u32, oh, sorry, i32. Second value is of type bool, and uh, third value is of a character. And um, i, b, and c, they're an i32, a boolean, and a character, respectively. And Rust can do this type inference. Uh, so you don't need to specify types all the time, which is quite nice. Um, 
And then let me see. So yeah, I've expanded out all the types. If you have a Rust, if you have a nice Rust plugin for your editor, then it, it'll tell you these uh, automatically. And um, so this is what the type of an array looks like. Maybe the tuple is pretty reasonable, right? You can see basically it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but an array is of I thirty-two five. So the second value is the size of the array, and the first value is what type is inside of it. And that's just how you denote types of arrays. It's the only, it's the only way you can denote types of arrays. Um, yes. Uh, so I don't think anyone's using this. No. Great. Okay. So uh, now we have structs. So um, we have uh, a struct called user. And this is how you define a struct a type. And active is uh, a type rule. So that's the variable name, colon, and then this type. So active is of type rule. Username is of type string uh, with a capital S, which is a different type from lower click, lowercase str. Uh, basically just denotes, um, uh, uh, basically denotes that this is a, an object. It's, an, it's, it's a struct, string is a struct allows you to do some nice stuff that the small string can't let you do. Um, and then uh, sign in count is a U64. Okay, great. So um, then we have a function main. We say let Tony uh, is equal to user active, true, always. Username is Tony. And then uh, his email is obabies42 at haskell.org. <laughs> Um, our, our, one of our most favorite lecturers, the lecturers in, um, in computer science uh, is a first year Haskell lecturer known as uh, Tony Field. And so that's why I've added that in. So and then you can just print those values or you can reference, sorry, this is how you create. Yeah, so that's, a, that's how you create it. You need that semicolon at the end because this is actually an assignment, it's a statement. Uh, and then um, we can print the variables of uh, the, the values in Tony by saying uh, username has logged in sign in count times and then it'll print in uh, it'll, it'll print um uh what is it yeah tony has logged in one thousand sorry twelve thousand three hundred forty five times pretty simple stuff any questions on structs actually yes um why do you have the string from because like with the uh, ah yeah so room, yeah so no you're right i didn't away, know, but you did not find out so the question was um why do we have the string from? It's a good, there's, there's a good question. I, I did actually forget to forget to specify why that was. So the reason is the values in type of here, as I inside of here, so Tony and O baby, they're of type small string. Um, and if you want, well, uh, you don't always have to put in an object, but if you want to, if you want to put this particular instance into an object or into a struct, you have to say, hey build me a string. So that's how you declare, um, this is how you declare, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, so that, that's how you say in the string uh, type, there is a function from which takes in a small string and uh, gives you a big string that will have the same value all the time. And so, yeah, so does that answer your question? Okay, great, cool. Any other questions about structs? Yes. Yeah, so I was wondering in languages like C, usually structs are fixed size. Mm -hmm. You seem to be using variable length strings. Ah, okay. so I was wondering. Good are... question. Yeah, so structs are of fixed size, actually. And that is a big thing about. So you have to know the sizes of most things are compiled by Rust, or else you can't really use them without like runtime checking of what's going on. And that, that's, that's true, what you've said is true. But this is also fixed size. This is fixed size despite having strings in the struct. That's because um, strings are, string structs, they are just fixed size structs, much like anything, with a pointer to an allocated part of memory. And um, yeah, so um, with an allocated part of memory. And um, so it exists in the heap. And so even though the, the, the struct in the stack is fixed size, it is fixed size, um, the data can be variable. And so you can have vex in structs as well, uh, your vectors, uh, which are growable arrays. 
and um, the struct is still fixed size. Rust knows the size of the struct, even if not, you know, if not the size of the size of the data at runtime. Um, even though the vec will definitely, and, and the string will definitely keep track of how big it is. So does that answer? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You also have to say that they're mutable or not in this case. Like, is in a, in a struct, would you have to say that a like for instance, the username is mutable? Oh, good question. We will try that out so I can demonstrate it. Yeah. Okay. We'll try it out. Um, so I'm going to create a small structure. A struct um, user. It's common case to name your uh, structs with an uppercase, all of your types, an uppercase um, name, just so Russ knows what's going on, and you get that really nice syntax highlighting that you don't otherwise. Um, and then we can say, uh, let's say, username is a string. Oh. Okay, cool. And then here, we'll make a new, we'll say let u1 is equal to user. And then uh, user name is string from, and then like Tony, I oh, know, Tony again, everything's Tony. And um, then we can say, what if we do view one dot user name is equal to um, string dot up oh, string from Nick, Nick, why not? Uh, and then, I'll assume I'm not going to print it out. If this compiles, I'm going to assume that it's worked. Um, because otherwise, I can guarantee you, guarantee you. Right. OK, so so ah, that is a mistake I made. Let u1 is not mutable. So if I make this struct itself mutable, does this compile? And I think uh, I obviously, I, I do know the answer. And it does compile, because the fields inside of a struct, they don't have to be mutable. If you have a mutable reference to the overall struct, then that's then you can assume that it's uh, correct. Um, sorry, then then you can mutate it. So I'm sorry, the, the the fields inside of the struct. Uh, is that clear? Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is a different type of struct. The struct I well, it's the same, but yeah, this is a different type of struct. So the last struct I showed you was what's known as a named struct. And this is an unnamed struct uh, or tuple struct. Um, it's effectively a new type. I think a lot of you have studied Haskell. If you haven't, then it's not important. Uh, basically, you're saying RGB color takes in three unnamed UAs. And, and that's just the type of um, RGB color. Um, we can let color is equal to uh, RGB color, and then we can specify the values. So it's 183, 65, and 14. That is the RGB value of the Rust color, so like the color of Rust. Then we can print out these three variables um, in succession, and that gives you, um, uh, and then it'll print out 18365. Yes. Functional progress and sensibilities. Tell me that because you made it beautiful, shouldn't make the internal content. Yeah. Sorry. No, you can make the record mutable or immutable. What you can do using what's known as the int interior mutability pattern, um, which is a bit of unsafe code, but uh, sorry, it's implemented using unsafe code, but it is checked and formally uh, proven. And also, the Rust compiler does ensure. Uh, sorry. Uh, at runtime, that the, 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 the rules of the compiler sets is true. You can make a struct immutable, but then make certain values of its fields in, uh, mutable. And how you do that, I'll get on to the third lecture because it's it's quite a deep thing. But for now, this is how we this is how we do it. So you can have your R functional, small f functional programming. Uh, so yes, uh, structs, and then you have enums. So RGB, uh, so this is an enum, sorry, an enumerable. Uh, you've seen this in other languages, I imagine. Um, basically allows a type to have several values, right? And um, an interesting thing you might see with this is that each of those enumerables have 
types in in brackets. Well, what's that going? What, what, what's going on with that? So in Rust, you're allowed to use these. Uh, sorry, you're, you're allowed to define uh, enums that contain values, enumerables that uh, enumerations that contain values of different types on the basis on a per enum basis. And um, how Rust handles this is quite cool, actually. Um, we introduce a new notation for actually a new, new control flow um, that I'll go into some more depth later. So uh, here we have RGB. So that's just what I showed you before. Um, it's a tuple struct. We have named, which is the name of the variable. And then um, we have hex RGB, where you just put in the number, we'll say. And you can assume that, uh, oh yeah, I should have called this like number RGB, but it's fine. Um, we create a color, uh, we create the instance of hex RGB. So it needs to have um, a U32 as its argument or else it won't compile. And that is also the color of Rust again. And then in order to use this value, we can't just say, give me the first variable of the first variable in the enumerations uh, of, um, of color because, um, well, Rust doesn't know what, and Rust can't know at compile, sorry, at runtime, what the current value of color is. Is it a hex RGB, is it RGB, or is it named? And so the phrase color dot zero makes no sense. The way you can access them though is with a match statement. And those of you have done, so uh, those of you who have done functional programming, this probably looks a bit more familiar to you, uh, but um, you can think of it like a case statement that where, um, for, for those of you who are more into C and C++, you can think of it as like a case statement where it allows you to pattern match. So that is get the values out of this struct depending on what it is. So in this instance where we have um, color is equal to color hex RGB, and then all of that, uh, it will print, well, you'll see that it's a hex RGB and it knows that type. And then you give color, uh, sorry, uh, so you say match on if this is color hex RGB. And this hex RGB has a value inside of it um, and then print that value. And so because hex RGB can only have one value at, uh, in it at runtime, um, you can guarantee that that's correct. And then, um, color named, um, sorry, uh, let's say we say color name rust, uh, which is a color. And we can say when you have a color that is of type named, uh, it will have a variable inside of it S and then we print that in this case, um, we print that value of S. And then color hex RGB, um, in this case, I've done something funny with the angle braces in, um, oh, with, with the curly braces, sorry, in, um, in print line. So before you've just seen it like it is in the other two examples, this is where you can do formatting. Yes. Can you define functions for enums? Can you define functions for specific enums? So different enumerations of enums? Or is it, I don't know. Methods, you, maybe. Yeah, methods. Oh, yes, you can. Uh, I'll get into that in the second lecture because it, uh, Rust type system is quite different from other languages. It, um, it's quite unique, you would say. And so I, I want more time to really talk about that. And so, um, yeah, so in this case, I'm saying it's a hex number with the hash. Give it six uh, leading zeros if necessary. And, and the formatter will say, um, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, and uh, X just says like, uh, also like, um, this, sorry, X says this is a, um, uh, hexadecimal value. And so it prints up here 0x b7. Yeah. And if it was not, is that clear to everyone? This is how you do enumerables or enumeration in Rust. You can't access the variables unless you know what size it is or what type it is. Yes. Do the enums come with like numbers, like, like you know, in C it defaults like 0, 1, 2. I think. Enums have a, I think enums have a method uh, that's generic across all enum called um, numerable. So let, let me look that up real quick because I think I can get to it fast. Um, I'm the, uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
So I think I look at this. Ah, it works. Okay. <laughs> okay, I I I'm not entirely sure at the moment. I'll get back to you on that. That's okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, I'm pretty sure you can though. It. I'm pretty sure that's something you can do, much like in C and C plus plus, because it is useful. Um, okay. I think that is. Yes, that's all I have for that section. So um, we'll take a small break now uh, for pizza. Uh, we'll allow you to breathe. Hey. Yeah, no, it's fine. You can tap it. <laughs> so yeah, take a small break for pizza. Um, my, our lovely doc soft defense officers, of which I am actually one, who will handle it. First of all, a question was asked about uh, enums. Oh, let me. Uh, a question was asked about enums, uh, whether or not you can see their order like you can in C and C plus plus, and I feel what language is. And yes, you can, but it requires that you assign it. It's part of the type in this case. Um, and so if you say, uh, if I run this now, uh, it will give me one and two, but uh, that's how you, uh, and you have to cast it to a U8 and, and then it'll give me one and two. And so you can order your enumerables like this or enums like this. And, um, that's how, that's how you would do such a thing. So I have seen it before. Lost. A bit lost to me. But okay. Right. So onto the control flow. Um, so first of all, we have an if statement, uh, most common type of control flow, I think. Uh, and it, it looks like everything, like any other if statement in almost any other language, except um, small thing, uh, you don't need the brackets around the, the expression. Rust's, uh, I think any self-respecting like compiler maker will can figure out what that means, right? And so, um, uh, in this case, you have x to be 42. You check, well, you take the modulo of it and check if it's zero. That's the same as checking if it's even. And then if it is even, you say the answer is an even number. And if, if it's not even, then it's odd. And um, the answer, <laughs> I have an even number. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to change that. I meant to say <laughs> the answer is an odd number. <laughs> now, that's a type of runtime bug that you can't solve in Rust. <laughs> so, unfortunately, Rust, Rust isn't powerful enough yet to figure out the, the, the statements are wrong. So, um, so, so here in uh, the if statement, you have a Boolean, right? So you take mod of two and then is it equal to zero? That's Boolean. You can't implicitly cast anything to a Boolean in Rust. Booleans are their own distinct types. And if you try to put an integer in there or something else, it's really not going to like it. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. There are no semicolons at the end of the print statement. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on. Um, I don't know if it's just coming from C or C. But I thought there was a bias against using macros. Uh, from why, why the sort of rust right. origin. Yes, yeah, so I'll repeat the question. So in C and C++, there is a bias against using macros unless you program in C and C++, in which case you use macros all the time. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The reason for that, the reason for the stigma against macros is that uh, you can't, okay, they're difficult to debug, right? Because the preprocessor comes in, sees where your macros are, and just pastes whatever code you have there, maybe adding some replacements where, where necessary. And so they're really powerful because of that. They allow you to minimize your code. They also, you, if, you make an ish, if you make an error in your macro, it's almost impossible to debug properly. Um, and like, yeah, that's just not great. But macros in Rust, and I'll, I'll get, hopefully I'll have enough time to go into this like way later in the lecture series. But what they do is they take Rust code not like just text where they take, they take Rust code, they have code, like actual code that converts that into, um, into the, how do you say, uh, into the relevant, like um, relevant expansion. Um, and then that is type checked and compiled and all that. And so I'm actually gonna give an example. I'll try thinking about where that macro would fail. 
Where would a print macro go? Ah, this is where a print macro would fail, actually. So we just take this example and just get rid of the thing. Very well made tool. Um, and then we say, yeah, what if we what if we say this? Print something, but nothing is there. Now, I'm not exactly sure what, what such a macro would look like in C or C++ or what it would even do. But um, in this case, Russ will hopefully, yeah. So one position argument to format string, but no arguments are given. That's an actual error message for, for a, that's an actual error message for a uh, macro in Rust. And it, it looks like just a compile time error. Like it, it, it looks like I had a real function. Yeah. To be clear, that is not a baked in error message based on print. That is yes. a general error message because it's using a macro. Uh, I think one positional argument in format string. Let me, that, that's a good question. Yes, because um, if this were an actual Rust compiler error, then it would give you a, uh, it, it, would, it would tell you the name of the error so you can go look it up. But it doesn't because the Rust compiler doesn't actually see these errors. These errors are for all macros. Um, if you so choose to add useful error messages, but yeah, no, it's that it's an, the Rust macro system is Turing complete. Anything you can compute, you can compute it in macros alone at compile time. There is a beautiful example of a HTML. I'm going to try finding this of a HTML um, uh, formatter Rust. So of a HTML formatter used in. Uh, I'm going to try quickly looking for the example um, because there is a really nice case of where it was used. I'll try finding that later. But but there's you can make macros that take in like HTML code and certain variables and will just make a full HTML string uh, with with those values in it and um, uh, also have really nice error handling. Allows you to like, for example, you can you can interpret Java code. I've seen that one as well. You can interpret Java code in a macro. I, yeah. You were thinking of U as the other web frameworks. What's it called? Y E W. Y E W. Okay, I'm gonna try U again just because I really want to see it. Y E W um, sample. Okay. So. Oh, um. Okay, so is this one? Okay, um, yeah, okay, fi finding, fi finding actual, uh, finding actual code I was, I was looking for uh, is going to take a bit longer than I was expecting. So I'm just going to, I'm going to say that I will uh, check this later. But um, yes, uh, so yeah, macros, extremely powerful. There is soon to be released macros 2.0, procedural macros 2.0, because the Rust team said, hey, macros, they're really powerful and uh, they can do a lot of stuff and they are neater than any other macro that you have, but uh, they're still not neat enough. Like this is the level of compiler tech we're talking about. And so they're, they're completely redoing it basically. Um, although this is not that type of macro, so this macro will stay and will look exactly the same. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. But um, yes, macros. Uh, back to the control flow statements after that small wrap. Uh, so, in a block statement, uh, the final semicolon is mm, optional. Um, and when you say um, when you when you write that out, when when you put the semi when you don't put the semicolon at the end, you're actually saying, "Hey, I'm returning this value." Um, like return this value. And um, when you put that semicolon at the end, it says go to the next statement. So in the final, in the final value, uh, in the final statement of this block, you actually don't need that semicolon. And this is what that allows you to do. So this looks pretty functional, I hope, um, which is quite nice. So you have x is equal to 42. And then you have this really weird thing where you say, let y is equal to, if x is even, x divided by two, else um, three times, like make it three times X plus one. Uh, and so that allows you to change the definition of something um, 
uh, depending on a certain uh, given statement uh, or are conditional. And so some questions that I, I wrote these out on purpose. So <laughs> what happens if the arms of the expressions are of different types? The Rust compiler just won't allow you to compile it, right? Like that's the whole point of Rust. So if, for example, you say like 2F32, then Rust would not let you compile it um, uh, in the X divided by two. What's the type of Y? Well, type of Y is what's the same type of the return statement in each of the brackets. So X is equal to 42, uh, which is an I32. Uh, X divided by two, that's also a, uh, an I32. And then three times X plus one, also an I32. Y is of type I32. We can do this inference automatically. And what happens if we don't add a, se a second branch to the if statement? So now you have a variable which is defined but not necessarily, oh, sorry, it's defined but not necessarily assigned. Um, Ross just won't allow you to do that. It'll say you're missing a, a, a branch, you're missing an armor. Maybe, maybe you're missing an else clause is what it will say more specifically. Um, yes. Sorry? Yes, there is a turn around for sure. Um, oh, oh, sorry, no, no, there is no, there is an attorney operator in Rust. That's how you do it. Ideally, I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Does have a unit type? Yes, it does have a unit type actually. So, if you were to say let x have type unit equals if without that. Oh, that's like you know maybe I imagine compiler text don't think about that, but it could be could be the case. Uh, let's go to Rust background. Let me say uh, print line. Um, so what we say let x. <laughs> Of unit type, we'll say is equal to. That's the question, basically. Hmm, okay. Um, if it's got true, why not? Uh, no. If yeah, no, I I can say if true. That doesn't look at result. Else, okay. So if true, then what well, we're just returning the unit type, which is nothing. Else, the unit type, which is also nothing. And so if I get rid of the else statement, this is going to compile. <laughs> oh, whoops. Whoopsie. <laughs> At least it prevented that one time. Uh, cannot be formatted with default. Yeah, okay. You can't, you can't print the unit type. Okay, but um, actually, it should push forward. No, okay, cool. So I don't actually think that's possible. So, sorry? Will, will this compile? I think that's probably. Does compile. Okay, right. So, so if X is the oh the unit type, right? Uh, so that that's an important feature. Uh, the unit type just says I am nothing effectively. Uh, it's of size zero. Um, uh, what would that be? Size zero. Size zero. So it's of size zero. That means that if you use null types, oh, sorry, if you use the unit type in um, uh, in runtime. Uh, then they don't actually take up any space. A great example of where this is used is a hash set in the standard library. It's effectively just a hash map with the second value, the, 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 the stored value. That's just a, that's a unit type. And so then um, checking if it exists is true, but it's also incredibly fast because Rust then can then optimize the hash set and say like, we're never actually returning this variable. We're, we're, we're not storing anything, and it, it does it makes all the necessary optimization. So it's very fast and very memory efficient. You, the unit type isn't particularly useful <laughs> in other places, but um, all the all functions such as main here um, that don't return a type return the unit type. It's important distinction. Uh, okay. Okay. So I think that's what was another one. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I just made sure because I wasn't super uh, sure, but the ternary operator does not exist in, in Rust. Um, yes, oh, did I skip past the few? Or, or was that exactly what I wanted? That's exactly what I wanted. Okay, cool. So we have a while loop. 
I mean, while loops aren't particularly, <laughs> particularly interesting, they're just while loops. And so um, they look the same. You have while with a condition. And then um, here I say if x is, it's very similar to the uh, if statement I just showed. If x divided by, if x is even, divide x by two else uh, times x by three and add one. And then the biggest number is the biggest num dot max x. So it's the same. What's the maximum between me and a different number of the same type? And um, uh, I have a little question. Please come to me very quietly after the lecture if you can prove it. But prove or disprove that for all x in the natural numbers, this program halts. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who may be unfamiliar, this is also known as a collapse conjecture. And so far, we have not solved it. Um, which is kind of weird because it's a very simple function, but we just we haven't we haven't managed to solve it yet. Um, I promise you the biggest num when x is 42 is 64. Oh, assert equals macros. Yes, it's the first time I think we've seen them. Maybe uh, assert equals is a macro. Yes, I got the proof for you. That's a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so within a couple thousand years, that program will have definitely halted. Can you prove that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> for all the numbers. Anyway, um, so it so equals just says, hey, give me two arguments of the same type. Are they equal? It's very simple. And if um, if that condition is not met, then um, it'll throw a runtime error. Um, uh, I think it's pretty standard to have that. Next one. Uh, so we have a loop statement. So we, okay, I think that's fine. Um, so we say, um, a loop statement is just an infinite loop unless you break out of it um, using the break statement, which I will show you shortly. We print line, are we done yet? And the answer is no, we're never done. Until you hit control C on your, on your keyboard, that loop will just print forever, no termination, nada. Okay, this is a more, oh yeah, go on. Why is there no semicolon after? Oh yeah, so, um, that is actually a good question. Uh, uh, it'll be answered on the next slide, right? I, I, I promise you that. So loops can return values much like, <laughs> and that's why, and that's why. Um, I haven't used this a huge amount. Um, I, have, I have actually used it in, in uh, the project I'm working on now. Usually you don't have something, the reason why this looks so complex is because I haven't actually introduced to you uh, something uh, that needs to be that, that, that needs to be shown yet to make code like this simpler code doesn't always look this verbose and rust uh, it's just that we don't know enough yet okay so um this is a loop uh if counter is equal to 10 uh, n then what we do is we break with the value of 10 and the value of 10 is then assigned to fact so so you have that um that's how you can break and then assign uh, a value to the to, to what you return on this doesn't actually occur for while statements. While statements don't have that because um, you can. It's it's difficult to say. I mean, it, it would look really ugly. I think this looks ugly. It would look really ugly if you had while, and then at the end of each while, you have to reassign what your return value would be. Yes. Sorry, I oh, okay. Uh, what does that mean? Actually, because it has loop. You can actually represent oh, yeah. functions just using loop. So, so um, in a project I'm working on, I have a uh, tree of hash maps, right? Um, and uh, the hash maps all point upwards, and you want to traverse upwards. Um, and what I did was I used a loop statement for exactly that reason, because Rust doesn't have tail call optimization yet. LLVM, which is Rust's backend, as I've mentioned previously, does support tail call optimization, but um, there's something to do with the way that Rust interacts with it, uh, with the way that the code is generated that prevents tail call optimization. And I've tried, I've really, really tried. I cannot get tail call optimization to work. I'll explain a bit about what that means in a bit, if, for those of you who aren't familiar, because we we'll going into functions soon. So um, yes, and this, this computes factorials in a tail recursive way. There is very clearly something you can do that would a for loop would, would be better suited. Uh, and so I do show that, but this is how you do it in a loop. And um, yes, that is uh, how you use that. Um, I'd, say, I'd say that's enough about uh, uh, loops clear. Oh, oh sorry, yes, sorry, I, I meant to come back here. A loop is a while true, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, 
it's not a loop while, which exists in some, or do while. And does the compiler catch, like, non if it's just not going to tell it? No. Nah. Okay, so that's one thing for us. <laughs> no, because, because then you could, and then you could solve the whole thing problem. Oh. <laughs> if, if if Ross was able to analyze a loop and say this halts, you could give it you could give it the set of all pro um, yeah you give you could give it itself and then declare whether or not. Subject of the results. Yes. I assume that only works for loop and not while. Uh, yeah, I, I just declared that like uh, sorry, I just said uh, a moment ago while loops don't support returning values because it would look ugly and. This is good enough. Um, anyway, okay, next one. Oh, any more questions about that? Move on. Yeah. So the only way to get out of a loop is by break, right? One way to get out of a loop. Is it the only way? Return. Oh, um, yeah, the only way to get out of a loop statement is via break or return, yes. Then couldn't the compile just examine if there's a break inside the loop? Yeah, yeah, but like whether or not the condition in so let's say we have this statement, if counter is equal to n. Oh, okay, yeah. So there is a likelihood that the Rust, comp the Rust compiler probably um, uh, finds a loop invariant with this uh, and, then, um, uh, and then performs a, uh, oh, 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 um, a, sorry, a certain type of optimization that means that this loop probably isn't actually running compile time at all. Quite surprising. Yes. Uh, no, break. no, no, no. I, I, so I showed you a example just now. So this doesn't have a break inside the loop, and the compiler, the compiler wants to have wants you to have easy loops if you want it. For example, like otherwise you couldn't you couldn't write a shell script in it. Uh, so uh, like a shell terminal, sorry, because that just wants to do forever. Yes. Break. If you break without a value, then it just becomes the. Um, uh, it just becomes the uh, unit type. So, so um, uh, yeah, it becomes the unit type, the thing I described earlier, the, the, one of the fundamental types. Did yeah. you say why you didn't need a semicolon? I think you did, but I missed it. Sorry? Did you say why you didn't need a uh, semicolon there? Yeah. Right, yeah, sure. Um, the semicolon isn't needed at the end of this particular statement because this actually is a loop as an expression. Okay. Um, and potentially, oh, sorry, no, sorry, uh, I did, uh, sorry. This, this doesn't apply here, my bad. Um, basically, at the end of blocks, you don't necessarily need um, uh, a semicolon. Um, uh, you can have a semicolon, it, it's just optional. You can have it or you can't, but if you want to return a value like, uh, I think the four loops is probably a bit. Sorry, the yes. statement. If you want to return a value like this, you put a semicolon, it says I am returning the unit type. Okay, yeah. And not your desired integer. So yes. Any more questions? Oh, okay, yeah. Is there a quick one because it keeps popping up? So all so print line doesn't return anything. But because it doesn't return anything, it necessarily returns the uh, the unit type. So any function which doesn't return anything returns a unit type. Uh, so no, so, yeah. So I, I guess you said that if it's at the end of any sort of block, um, it gets returned. But then for a while, you don't do the same thing. But then you said you can't return anything. Okay. Uh, we can we we can quickly write an example of that. Up. So uh, I'm just going to say while true. Um, five. Um, so, unless my understanding is incorrect, uh, yes. So, um, you can't do it there because it is returning and uh, it is returning a type. Uh, and so, you need that semicolon there, or else um, it, it, it won't. How do you say? Um, what if I say? Sorry. I'm just trying stuff out to get a better understanding of how this particular aspect works. Uh, yeah, okay, right. So you, you do need that, you do need that semicolon or else the Rust compiler dislikes it. Uh, okay, right. Um, for loops, right. I, I promise one. Uh, <laughs> so for i in, 
So it's an in usage. Um, and then one dot dot equals 15. This means the inclusive range of one and 15. So all the numbers from one up to 15. This is an implementation of FizzBuzz, a uh, popular like, programming problem you can, you can do. Uh, it can be given at interviews. And um, we're saying, um, how do you say? Uh, so the for loop is the more common part. You can't return values from a for loop. Uh, but um, what you can do is, um, so, so this syntax is weird actually. The syntax is weird if you're a C or C++ developer uh, because C and C++ style loops don't exist. They don't, the for loops don't exist where you have like, you declare your type or you declare your counter maybe. And then you um, uh, check to see if that uh, counter is like, if you need to terminate yet, and then you uh, increment the counter or whatever. That does, that doesn't exist in Rust. Um, uh, because of mutability, I think, although I'm not sure. But I is actually not mutated, it's redefined so, uh, in each of these instances. And so, um, yeah, it's just a design choice they made. I've never had a time where I've been like, man, I really wish I had a C++ loops because I'll get into a bit more later, but this is what's, this is using a language concept known as iterators, which are like, it's a functional, although has slipped into other languages recently. Um, it's a functional idea, but about how you traverse a data structure, we'll say. But for now, we're saying this is a range of 1 to 15. Uh, ask the question. I think the implementation of FizzBuzz is a completely correct. All right, okay. If, have, if it's either Fizz or Buzz, you don't print the actual number, right? Sorry? You're always printing the number. Isn't the idea of FizzBuzz is that if it's either modular three or five, you don't print the actual number. Oh, fair you enough. Yeah, I, I guess that's a, an issue with your interpretation of the FizzBuzz problem. But uh, I guess for readability, I always want to print out the, the number itself. Yeah, fair enough. I thought there was an actual problem with my logic, and I was like, man, I'm never getting a job ever again. <laughs> uh, another question? I saw a hand up somewhere, maybe? No? No? OK, cool. All right, next slide. Um, yes. Uh, so the for loop continues. So this is using that iterator stuff. I, I promise I will go into iterators. They're a very important part of the language. But you can say a for loop over the values of an array, or, or um, actually most things which allow you to turn them into iterators. And so you say for i in array dot into iter, and you're iterating over the values of the of the uh, of the iterator. Um, and then uh, this is just a summation problem it's not that not that's not um yes so is there a better way to do this yeah, yeah i was talking about this. yeah i was talking about it so um you can use iterator functions i highly suggest you look up what iterators are um to just do a left fold or a right fold or reduce uh that would, that would give you some i think this no i i i won't say there's a sum for iterators yet yeah a better use of iter here since we're not mutating arrays. Um, yes, but then I'd have to talk about copy semantics, and I don't want to do that. Okay. That's why I picked that up. Um, we'll get into like, yeah, so there exists another function very similar called iter. And what iter does is that it doesn't actually take the values, it takes references to those values. Uh, but I, I want to explain what references are um, in, in proper, in enough time because. They're different in Rust to what they are in like pointers and references in C and C++ in order to give you the guarantees that, that Rust provides you. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get on to that, I promise. Um, yes, so um, this is a match statement. You've seen a match statement for deconstructing an enum, um, but this is how you can pattern match amongst uh, values. Um, so we say, you know, age is equal to 42. If age is between zero and 17, uh, inclusively, then this person can't buy alcohol. If it's greater than 120 or greater than or equal to 120, that's how you do that notation. So anything larger than it. Are you sure you have the right age? And then underscore means like, it's called the eh operator in a lot of languages. It means otherwise. So, uh, well, in this case, it means, sorry. In this case, it means um, I don't care what the value is. If you haven't matched the top two, like, don't worry about it. And then you say this person can buy alcohol. Um, 
alternatively, um, I could use a named variable. So unnamed variables aren't really, um, how do you say, used. You can't say, like, you know, print, you can't print the value of the age that's matched there. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you can't print that value because underscore doesn't, doesn't allow you to do that. But what you, what you could do is say x at the bottom, so that's a named variable, it's a proper variable. And then you could say, print out that, that variable. So like the person is of X age and can buy alcohol. Um, yeah. Uh, if you don't meet all the cases, Rust will scream at you. That's lovely. I love that um, because I often do. <laughs> I'll have an enum, and this is different from a, um, this is different from a, a switch statement in, in other languages where um, you can do whatever you want. You can have a default or maybe not, I think. But uh, I'm not super versed in C++ and C. But um, yeah, if you don't if you don't meet all the possible values, Rust will scream at you. Um, yes. And what happens if you put floating point numbers in it? So there are issues with floating point numbers to do with precision. And so if you want to match over them, you you can't do that because. Oh, sorry, you can't have them in the, you, you can match over them. You can only talk about ranges. You can't talk about like actual literal values. You can't say match and then in one arm have uh, 3.14159265434. You know, you can't have that. It's just, you have to have like ranges or any sort of values. Um, yes, are we getting, oh, oh sure, sure. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Um, Yes, and so uh, this is another way. Oh, yes. So will the floating point thing be checked by the compiler, or Sorry? is this not recommended? Yeah, no, no. Flo floating points. So by the compiler. yeah, the compiler will scream at you if you try to check if you try to check the floating point numbers. It's quite magical, in my opinion. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it has to be integral types. So it has to be predefined values, continuous <laughs> values, and all that. Anyway. So um, at that point, you just want to use an if statement. Um, I've done it in a slightly different way, but also I've added a, an, an assignment operator. And what this assignment operator does is it says, uh, sorry, it's very similar to all the other assignment uh, uh, control flows we've seen before. So we say, if it's between zero, and this is an or pattern match. So if it's between zero and 17, or greater than 100, or greater than or equal to 120, then just return false. There's a very bad example. There's many, plenty, many ways you could do it better, but this is how I've decided to show this. And then otherwise, just return true because you know it's restricted within that range. And then um, can buy alcohol. Uh, yeah, so I'm just asserting that it's true, but uh, that's all. Uh, a little note is that I've made age and I, uh, sorry, um, a uh, I32, not a U32. So in this case, if you were minus four, then you could buy alcohol. Uh, okay, uh, I think I've run out of time uh, for today. I mean, I guess I would be happy to, are people happy for me to run over slightly so I can just talk about functions? Are we okay with this? How slightly? How slightly? Like, if you give me 10 minutes. <laughs> That's is that okay with everyone? Okay, cool. I have enough thumbs up, like actual thumbs up. That's good. Okay, cool. Straight to the point then. Functions. So this is a function called print me. Um, it takes an, uh, an I32 and just prints a value. It returns, what does it return? Does, it, does anyone know what it returns? The unit type. Yeah, exactly. The unit type. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that prints the value, prints the value of X and believe me, this works. What are the types of this? So the first parameter is I32 and it returns the unit type. We can have things that return other values and this is that notation. So you see that like forward, like that arrow, that arrow means we're returning this type. And so much like other control flow statements, you can return X times Y in this case, just by, just by not having a semicolon. You don't need a return statement um, always. You do have the return statement, but you don't always need it is, is my point. Um, in cases like this, and yep. So, okay, recursive functions. This is fun because we get to use pattern matching now. Oh, so n is a u32 and returns a u. Sorry, fib is a 30, uh, is a function takes an n32 and returns a u32. Uh, I'm trying to go fast and it's not working. 
So we match over n. If n is 0, 1, return n. It, it's one of the definitions of the Fibonacci sequence. You can start at 1 or, or, or just 0 and 1. And then otherwise, we, we take fib of n minus 1 and n minus 2, clearly a recursive function. Um, uh, and yeah, so the 10th Fibonacci number is 55. I think you can verify that if you want. Um, much like any other, if you, um, uh, much like most other control flow statements that are assignments, um, returnments, uh, sorry, returns, uh, they must be of the same type. Uh, they must be of the same type um, or else the compiler will scream at you. At your, and you have to, you have to return somewhere. You can't, you can't, let's just say like, if X, sorry, if, uh, yeah, you have to return on every possible uh, exit branch. Okay, so higher order functions. So this is taking functions as functions and, uh, sorry, uh, functions are taken functions. And so we have array dot map, which is just taking, what it does is apply a function to every single value uh, in the array and then returns that array. And so double takes a number times it by, times it by two and then uh, returns that. And so that, that, that array one transform becomes this. Um, but yeah, there are some issues. Defining a global function just be used once as a higher order function is messy, especially if it's specific to a function. And function primitives can't capture scope. Right. Is there a better way? And by scope, I mean, like, let's say I wanted to times the value by an, like a, a value I've predefined, but don't want to take that in to the actual function. I don't want to pass it in. Well, then it can't capture the scope of where it's being called. And so, um, there is a better way. And that better way is, uh, they're called closures actually. And they look a lot like lambdas. Um, they're kind of like lambdas. There's no currying if you're you know, into Haskell. And so we say let double, which is a function now, be, and then those like pipes X, where it's X times two. And so then we assert that eight is double, uh, sorry, double applied to four, right? Uh, the types are double. So it notices here, oh, this is quite interesting. If I take out the use, uh, the assert equal, Rust doesn't know what types it is. It infers the type from how it is used, which, which is actually, it, it means you don't need all of the, like all of the messy, like you know, type, uh, uh, sorry, type, um, uh, uh, you don't need to declare the types, yes. I mean, if you use a multiple location, but you use it differently, it infers a different type each time, or does mm. it not like that? Good question. Uh, so the question is, if you use it multiple different types, the times with different types, uh, does it infer that, or does it complain? And the answer is the Rust compiler complains. It doesn't like to do anything for you, right? Because because if you needed if you needed to have it for different types, then you actually have to make several different variables. Uh, but it needs to know the types at runtime, and so it'll just complain instead. Right. Uh, next one. Oh yeah. So the types uh, returns uh, i32 takes in an i32. Very simple. Now this is this is the best part, right? So you have a number n that you want to multiply all of the values in this uh, array by, and then you don't want to. Uh, sorry. And then you have this array, and it's the array. And then you can say array dot map, and then include a inc include a closure in line. And that allows you to make some really elegant, you use closures like this in Rust all the time. It, they're, so, they're a very elegant way of like having lambdas uh, in Rust. Um, and so, yeah, and so you might notice n exists in here. It takes in the scope of the outside variable. So it, it knows that n is equal to two. And so when you times, so when you use the scope, um, it times it by n. And here you just get the same answer, but that's it. But there's a problem with functions. And this is actually, this is pretty much where I end um, because then I can talk about things next time. So we'll have like that user struct that I was talking about earlier, but for brevity, you can see it's all at the bottom. I can't include it in the, in the slide. So you have the user stru uh, struct, and then you have a function called sign in user. that takes a mutable user and, take, and gives out a user. And then you say user.signing count plus equals one, and then user.active is equal to true, and then you return the user. And so then Tony is equal to you know, user as before, but he's not active this time. 
And you can say let Tony is equal to sign in user Tony, and you assert uh, that like that's his signing account, which has been uh, increased by one, and you assert that he is active. That's very messy. You're redefining a variable. You can redefine it in the same name, but you don't necessarily want to do that. And I think there is a, I think the next slide is a, yeah. So if you want to say, what's the length of Tony's username, which is, it's very small, it's four. So, um, so you have this function. It takes user.username, which was a string, and we take that length, and then gives out a use size, right? You have to give out a use size at this point. And so it takes the length and it commutes the length correctly, except this code doesn't compile. It doesn't compile. Hmm. That's weird, isn't it? You, know, you wouldn't expect that, but the code doesn't compile. And so you say let L is equal to length of username Tony. And then you can say assert equals for one, correct. Uh, that, 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 there's no problem with that. But you assert that Tony is not active. Um, I don't know why I did that. That that would fail in runtime. But um, oh, sorry, you you said that hasn't been changed. Sorry, that doesn't work. This is the issue here. You've passed Tony as a value to something. As a result, Rust doesn't let you use it again. That's the bread and butter. That's that's how Rust works. That's what, how Rust can ensure that all of this remains type safe, right? And we'll get to how Russ does that next lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> if we return a function, I will get on to the next lecture. I show it.